everybody burps. F and taxes and everybody burps. John Dunn. Hey, thanks. What I put together here, you know, there's so many aspects of river history you can, can look into. There's, you know, certainly the modification of the habitat, uh, the channelization of the river and so on. What I was kind of interested in was a Kansas City specific history of water pollution. What happened here water pollution wise throughout, you know, the history of the city. And so that's where I put this uh, talk together and you, what you'll see is a little bit of name dropping and some of the famous fathers of the city are, are mentioned, but also some of the pictures and some of the things that are just kind of forgotten history, so I, I hope you like it. You know, let's kind of start early on. Um, we usually start thinking about the Missouri River and Kansas City when we get to Lewis and Clark, you know, they camped at Caw Point and all that. So we think of that, about that, but then there's like this long period of about 50 years where the history's a little bit murky. We realize that there's, uh, you know, Lewis and Clark, and then we get to, the 1820s and early river boats are coming up and down the river and they're starting to pull out snags and make the river more navigable. They weren't shortening it yet, but they were you know, essentially making it passable for ever larger boats. Uh, they were opening key land routes as well across uh, the, the country for the western, western expansion. And so that was running a little bit different track than the river. As you'll notice, the river kind of zigzags through the landscape, whereas the physical paths, they were trying to make straighter paths throughout the landscape. By the 1830, they had figured out the fords of the rivers, the, the, the shallow places where you could run a, a wagon across a river. And uh, they also began to find uh, landings, places where you could tie up a steamboat. And so that, those became important places. And towns began to form, you know, small collections spread across the landscape. The river was the key route of transportation. The river was a way to get around. I mean, it was pretty hard to, to drag a horse and buggy across the landscape, but the rivers were a faster means of travel by even canoe. And so the river became the main transportation route and trade started morphing into the west, westward expansion. And when we get to the water pollution, the first time we get to water pollution and where it really becomes an issue in Kansas City is uh, where we see waterborne disease, cholera. Uh, cholera was a world epidemic, okay? It's been through seven times now, depending on how you count. And uh, waterborne disease, there are many waterborne diseases, but that one was really special, and that was the first one that, that we saw here in Kansas City. Uh, there was a, a first epidemic in 1832, and uh, people died in St. Louis from that epidemic, and it did go throughout the world, and, and thousands and thousands of people killed. 1849 was the start of the second epidemic, and uh, it started in Paris. In London, 14,000 dead. New York in the thousands, New Orleans 3,000 dead. Throughout the Middle East it's unknown, but, but count, countless tens of thousands. Uh, St. Louis, 4,500 to 6,000 dead. You wonder, why so many in St. Louis? What happened there? Well, what happened in St. Louis was earlier that spring they had the Great Fire. There was a steamboat caught on fire on the, on the river, it broke its moorings, and the burning boat then floated down into other boats, burned 23 boats. It then caught the riverfront on fire and burned down 400 wooden structures in St. Louis. So all of the, essentially the whole central riverfront burned down. And so what happened is those were all tenements and all the people got pushed up you know, into the neighborhoods around them. And the sanitation for the city of St. Louis at that time was using caves beneath the city. They just dropped, dropped pipes down into them. And so as the, the sewage piled up and then disease came to town on a riverboat, sick people come into a situation like that, the disease was rampant through St. Louis, and so just thousands killed. Cholera followed the river too, and it followed in, you know, essentially in sick people. Sick people would get on a boat, and they'd get off a boat in some place, and, and then the disease would, would catch on and be spread to others. Now cholera, this is a French medical text from the, the 1832 version. Cholera was a disease. What happens is bacterial disease and, and it, diarrhea and vomiting, and people died with amazing swiftness. A person could be looking healthy in the morning and be dead by that night. So rapid de dehydration, and it was rapid onset. And if you didn't have clean water, you were a goner. Uh, one of the, the things we find now is that all you really need is an IV bottle in time to, to live through a, you know, a case of cholera. But you don't always have that, and they certainly didn't then. 
So people would be very emaciated very quickly. It was pretty scary. So 1849, Kansas City. Kansas City was a little town then. It was about 300 people. And so it came to, came to town on a riverboat. Some guys got off the boat. Uh, they went up in, into town, probably to OK Tavern on OK Creek. And there was an OK Tavern, and there still is an OK Creek. Uh, first day, 30 people dead in a town of 300. A Mormon colony was wiped out. A third of the population was lost, and the place just picked up and ran away. I mean, simple as that. The town scattered. In, as part of that same epidemic, a second round came through. And in 1852, it rolled back through again. Uh, Westport, 48 deaths the first day. Independence, 40 deaths. Uh, Kansas City, more than 20. The towns scatter again. <laughs> so you have a town that, you know, Westport and Kansas City, where we were in what was old Westport. That was about 300 people. And that was on the land route headed west. And there was then a road up into Westport Landing, now known as Kansas City. And that was the small town up on the river where goods were unloaded and they went back and forth. So things could come up the river on the fast boat, come into town on a wagon, be placed on a wagon headed west. And so that was how a lot of supplies for mounting expeditions and, and migration into the west occurred. So 1853, this first sewer was built on OK Creek. Now, it wasn't a sewer as we would know it today. It was probably a wooden ditch headed down the hill. Uh, notice there was no treatment. We laughed. That was, that was, that was good stuff then. Uh, and that was pretty much the norm. Now, there is still a sewer main. That's what is now Grand Avenue. And there is still a sewer main there to this day. It's been replaced many times, and last time maybe 20 years ago, but that, still, that place still exists. OK, now to give you a little bit of world perspective on this. Over in London, they were dropping like flies over there, as I mentioned before. And there was a physician, John Snow. And what he did, very specifically, was he started mapping cases of, of cholera. And that was the first start of epidemiology. And then what he did is he figured out that there was a polluted pump, and that was the source of the disease. He, had, he looked at the water under a microscope, and for the first time, he saw bugs in water and said, hey, this isn't good. And so he was the first guy that figured out that this the cholera was a water-based disease. Everybody thought it was miasma, which was bad air. So, you know, bad air, bad science. Uh, he was greatly opposed, but what he did was talk the city's fathers of taking the handle off the well, off the polluted well. A friend of mine took this picture in London, and I told him I thought it was mighty geeky of him to, take a, to go in London, when you've got to Heim in London, to go see a polluted well, and he said that there was a pub there, so that made it okay. Now, I, I tell you, we wiped out the town twice, and yet Kansas City was going to take off no matter what. The westward ex expansion was just unstoppable. And so the number of people going through here, even though the, the population of Kansas City and Westport was somewhat small, the amount of people floating through was remarkable, and the towns got bigger. So what happened is they became connected as transportation hubs, as I mentioned before, and Kansas City became a major port on the river. Remind, be reminded, it's right before the river heads north and at a split of two big rivers. Now, this town of Kansas City was a, a great place for a city, but a poor site. It was uh, what we would actually consider in these days a natural wonder. At that time, they thought it was a terrible place and should be tamed. So uh, I'd like to read you just a little bit of something, just a couple of quick readings. I got these out of a history of Wyandotte County. Uh, here's the first one. It was a decidedly rugged site for a town. Kansas City is as level as a floor today by comparison. There were practically no flat spaces then. Then the whole town from at the outset was made of steep, muddy, rocky hills covered with towering timber and slashed with deep ravines plowed out by rushing streams. So it was a, a low soil, a lust soil, and it was uh, remarkably hilly and wooded. Here's another. Uh, uh, right up on the, on the area. This would have been down around City Market. This was from the Reverend Father Bernard Donnelly. He was Kansas City's first priest. He wrote, I strolled through the tall forest of, ten, of the 10 acres. The site was romantic, retired, and solitary. The manners and habits of the woodpeckers, parakeets, now extinct, jaybirds, black and rattlesnakes, coons and squirrels were a source of amusing study to me. So you really have a natural wonder here in Kansas City. And if we had that as a park now, it'd probably be considered one of the jewels. Uh, 
Well, here's what happened. What are you going to do when you've got a big old hill where you want to have a city? You plow it out and you throw it in the river. So that's what was done here. This is 1867. We're looking, you know, kind of post-Civil War, barely after the war. And what they did is you can see at the bottom of the picture, there's, there's a plow, and they would use those and drag it through that, that lust soil, and it was easily dislodged, and then you could, could put that uh, soil on, on carts and throw it in the river. And, so that, and as you can see, look at the excavation. So those are 60 and 70 feet high, it looks like. And uh, so they would just cut roads through to the river. And here's a, here's a view, 3rd and Delaware, that's a block away from the uh, city market. This is where a, a, the new streetcars are going through what would be right there at this time. There you go. That's just looking the other way on that same corner. So, you know, even though houses had already been built, they just plowed it down beside of them. Uh, you, you know, wouldn't you love to live on that house without any kind of uh, footings? That street now has been completed and is a block long, where you, you see as they went, they just built houses and took out the dirt as they went. If you look at this, mount, at this view of the riverfront in 1869, you can see, if you, if you look kind of carefully, you can see places where excavation has occurred and where excavation has been uh, started or not completed. You can also see a lot of signs of erosion. So there was probably an awful lot of soil not only being thrown into the river, but being eroded into the river as it went. This is the first hotel in Kansas City, the Gillis House, and a, a gentleman, a Dr. Troost, Troost Avenue, uh, put in a second hotel right next to it. Uh, also, look in this picture, and you'll see the piles of dirt on the uh, on a bit of the bluff by the river. That's where they were throwing dirt in the river, waiting for the floods to carry it away. Now, here you'll see, we talked about OK Creek, the first sewer. This is probably round number two of the same sewer. As you've noticed, they've uh, bricked it in. That's the little tunnel you see down there in the picture. And then they used the, the soils that the, in the area to level that off. And so that was buried later on about 100 feet deep beneath the soil as they raised portions of the town and flattened off others. So they tried to create a, a more flattened landscape in the city. Once again here, you see urban planning at its best. Uh, Mixed-use development, if you will. Uh, look at all the hodgepodge of buildings. You see everything from uh, feedlots to stores to houses and cuts willy-nilly within them. 1886, 9th and Broadway. Uh, again, mixed-use development then was far different than we see it now. If you notice, there was a bank across the street from a, a feedlot. Now the city, as it grew, you can see there how it was beginning to fill in, get bigger. So what happened is the city started drawing people from afar. And so you got started to get the growth of the engineering population in the city. Uh, this is Robert Gillum, Gillum Avenue. And he came to town as one of the first in early engineers. And he was a, a, a Eastern trained engineer and a very good one. He worked on all kinds of projects. He worked on mass transit bridges and early water and sewer projects. He was kind of a catch all builder. And uh, he was, like I say, he was one of the first big engineers of the city. Here was one of his projects. This was uh, 1890s or so. This is a, a lift, a cable car, out of the West Bottoms. You can see how the West Bottoms have grown by then. Uh, just explosive growth. And uh, Kansas City was a city that at that time really embraced mass transit. So, you know, streetcars, horse-drawn, uh, trains, uh, cable cars, all of this. Kansas City was a kind of a place you could get around in very easily with, you know, without personal transportation. And it was to be that way for the next 50 or 60 years. Kansas City was a mass transit town. You wouldn't know it now. Yeah. <laughs> now, just to give you an idea of explosive growth, and that's kind of the, maybe the theme here of, of this talk, a uh, good portion of it. I told you in 1853, or eight, yeah, 1853, we get a town totally decimated, picks up and leaves, a town of 300. This is now 20 years later, less than, you know, less than 20 years later, look at that. So all that in just 20 years. Look at the West Bottom, okay, 1869. You can see there's a few things going on there. Let's jump ahead 25 years, bang. So the town was growing, you know, rip-roaring. And as you see, lots of trains coming in. That was to create one of the greatest slaughtering operations for, for cattle coming from the West that we, you know, 
was huge. And so trains came in from all of Kansas and from much of the American West, bringing in beef, beef cows and, as well as swine, and they were processed down there in the West Bottoms. And that occurred way up until like the 60s in, in Kansas City. And where was the treatment? There was none. So when you look at the, the sewers, when we talk about sewers in this day and time, we're talking about basically pipes to the river. We did not see treatment. Even though treatment was being developed at this time or starting to, we weren't seeing it here. Now I talked about pipes. I'd like to tell you who made all the pipes. Now this individual, you've probably never heard of him. His name is William Dickey. And uh, what, he, what he did is probably he created a, a product. It was clay pipe. Now you've all seen clay pipe, you know? It's kind of got that reddish hue and it's got almost a glass-like feel inside. That was a salt glazing and that was his, his trick, his claim to fame. He made the big clay pipes and what happens is when you've got pipes like that, they're very water resistant and, and stuff slides through them pretty easily. They don't foul up like, like crummy wooden pipes running down the hill. And so he came up with that and his industry grew greatly. He had, at, at the height of his, his industry, he had 39 factories making pipe all over the U.S. and even in Mexico City, so huge factories. Obviously a very wealthy man. He also owned a barge company that worked on the Missouri River. So, you know, he, he made a buck or two. Now, it's funny because this guy, why don't you know who he is? Well, he, he died poor. Uh, what he did is he uh, took on the, the Pendergast machine, which I'll talk about later, built his own newspaper, tried to rail against unions and the corruption of the city, which was actually working phenomenally well for us. And so he, he was basically died poor. His company lived on, but he, he ran out of money. Now, why, there's another reason why those pipes are important. A lot of Dickey Clay pipes are still under this city, but I'd like to talk about the other use for them that we never think about and how the Dickey Pipe Company changed our landscape. Not here, but to our north and to our east. Dickey clay pipes were not just used for sewage in cities. They were used for draining of fields and for the telephone company. Ma Bell bought a bunch of them. They ran wires through them. But the clay pipe, the draining of Iowa, is one of the biggest ecological farm conversions of wetlands ever. The Chinese beat it once before in history, but other than that, this was pretty much the big one. And what they did, in Iowa, you've got these swampy soils full of water, and if you can lay pipes, open-ended pipes or uh, perforated pipes beneath the ground five feet or so, you can then drain that water off, and so what you have is a water table sitting four or five feet beneath the surface, and corn just thrives in that, which those pipes are still draining fields to this day. And so you took what was a, a wetland full of thousands and thousands of ducks and converted it to farmland. So all of southeast Iowa and much of southern Illinois was converted wetland. And so that was, you know, it's our farm belt now, but it was a tremendous loss to the environment. Here's a look at some of his factories. You can see the pipes stacked up. Now notice there are no air pollution rules. <laughs> so this was a, a factory down in Pittsburgh, Kansas, but you get the postcard, you can see that they were burning a little bit of coal. Now to give you an idea how, what the pipes look like, you've probably all seen this kind of stuff, but they're all stacked in the ground as you see right there. This is an, a later picture, 1920, but pipes like this were laid all over the city and throughout our region, throughout much of the Midwest. Now, the clay pipes, they're wonderful, they're very durable, but the thing is, they leak. John's rules of pipes, sort of like a Murphy's Law corollary or something, all pipes leak. And so to this day, these pipes leak, and that is a, that is a bit of a legacy for us. Now, taking us through to the turn of the century, I showed you that amazing growth, and then I wanted to talk about some of the big things that were changing as, as we went past the turn of the last century. 1895, West, Westport formed a sewer district. So some of the pipes we're probably still using, and maybe even in this building, were beginning to be laid at this time. We're about a block from the center of Westport, just up here at the corner. Uh, talked about big engineering firms. Burns and McDonald was, was formed in that year. They made a big 13 cents of profit. I uh, wanted to give you, a, a, there's a little court case here that's kind of interesting. It's Hoffman versus Walsh. Why it's interesting is because it shows us, again, laying clay pipes at a place and a time near us, but it's also a funny story. 
Hoffman was a bricklayer, and he was working on a house at 45th and Warwick, which is just a few blocks from here, okay, over by the Nelson. And so Hoffman was a blasting company and was blasting out places to lay the dicky clay pipe for the sewers going down the hill. And so what happened is Hoffman pulled off a blast, and a rock flew 500 feet and hit Walsh and injured him. And so he sued. And uh, the, where the stu story is kind of funny is the Hoffman Company said, it's not my rock. <laughs> you know, it's kind of Monty Python, but they said, it's not our rock. And the courts found that it was their rock, and even though they had taken some precautions, they had in indeed injured the gentleman, and they owed him money. And that's still, this case is still a commonly cited case of if you do something silly, you have liability. Now, that puts a pipe in a place and time with a story, but we're talking 1904, the old house is on Warwick that you can still go over and see Dickie Clay Pipe is still laying beneath those houses. And it's still, you can dig up streets today and they're replacing pieces of it. If it breaks, it gets replaced, but you get the idea. Is this, this infrastructure that we put in place is still there. And uh, notice also water treatment systems were coming online. I'm talking water pollution and but water treatment systems were coming online as well. And so they were laying old iron pipe beneath the, the streets of the city, and, and guess what? That old pipe is still serving us. When you hear about a water main break of the 100-year-old pipe, that's, that's where it came from, is, is you know, you're, we're still living off that infrastructure that was built back then, and getting to the time we're well past when we thought we'd have to replace it, we're having to go back and replace it. And guess what? It's a lot more expensive this time. Now, getting a sewer was a big deal. This is in Waterloo, Iowa, but they built a sewer, which is now considered a CSO and is actually being controlled as a source of pollutants because it, it just bypasses all treatment. But this was a, a sewer that they built that drained town, assured that they didn't flood, but notice that they had a, a white tablecloth dinner in the sewer. This was a sound, sign that a town had arrived. We don't think about it now, but if you went out every day of your life and, and just could smell it, you know, everywhere, getting a sewer uh, below grade and vented properly and, and working properly was just considered a, a great sign of development. We kind of enter in what I'll call now the age of drainage. Notice I don't call it the age of treatment. We were no longer treating. And in fact, Kansas City wouldn't treat its waste for many a year. Uh, you were getting collection systems with overflows, what we could call combined sewer overflows. So what happens is you put the stormwater and the wastewater all in one pipe, and it's a big pipe. Most of the time, there's barely any wastewater going through it. And then when you have a big storm, it carries larger flows. And if the flows get too big, then there will be an overflow of some sort of structure at the top of the pipe where the pipe just discharges into the stream someplace. And we call those CSOs. And what happens then is in a, a rain event, untreated sewage gets bypassed into waterways. There were some, uh, a lot of big projects then, the Turkey Creek Diversion. If you go down Tur Turkey Creek down by 7th Street uh, Rainbow, you'll see that the river there just kind of, or the creek just kind of makes a left-hand turn and goes through the bluff and comes out the other side in the Kansas River. That was a diversion, and what that allowed is the real Turkey Creek to be turned into a, a CSO, a collection system, for the expansion of the stockyards. Uh, no treatment, just a collection system. Uh, this was the time when uh, James Pendergast came in to, to the city's knowledge. Uh, he was a Kansas Cityan, but the Pendergast machine. Uh, that was huge because the Pendergast machine built a lot of things in the city, a uh, totally corrupt situation, but they also built a lot of our, our water infrastructure as well. Pendergast ran ready-mix concrete. And notice I said concrete. If you said the word concrete, remember I told you about Dickey? At his newspaper, if you said the word concrete in his office, you got fired. Um, but he had the ready-mix concrete, and so this was his legal business. And then on the side, he had a piece of everything else, union dues, uh, liquor, gambling, prostitution, the whole bit. He got a skim off of everything. And so he was essentially creating big make-work projects, what they did was they used 10-year bonds. And you're looking at the Great Depression here, and people would invest in these 10-year bonds, and those bonds then raised money for big civics projects, which were basically economy stimulators. If you raised a big money with the bonds, then you had a big project, and you had a bunch of guys out there with shovel, pouring ready-mixed concrete. 
And so that hired, it hired a lot of people, and then all that money from their wages and their spending went right back into the machine. It, it really worked. It was, it was corrupt, but it was actually the right thing for the time and for the city. Now, to, to show you how some of these things occur, and uh, again, right here is Brushy Creek. As you have a city urbanize, things start happening. Water, waterways change, and Brushy Creek here becomes a perfect example of how that occurred in Kansas City. Here you can see the, the native stream. This is probably around the turn of the century, and this is looking up towards Rock Hill, Rock Hill Bridge. There you see it. A few years later, rip-wrapped. That's probably in the 20s, but they've rip-wrapped the banks, again, improving drainage, making water move faster. Notice that the, that the creek is silted in now. What's, what's causing that? Well, you've got in the upstream watershed above it, you're urbanizing that watershed, and you're getting a lot more erosion, and uh, rainfall events are routing through there and dropping a lot of solids into that river. So you choke off a stream. So urbanization does that, chokes streams. And then finally, you get the, uh, the ready mix treatment. And that's the, the river, is, or the creek as we saw it in the 70s. It, this had really been a project that had been around for a little while, but that's where you can find a lot of photographs. And only recently have we had the, uh, you know, the, the project there to uh, create a more beautiful walkway. I mentioned there were CSOs in the city, and, and there were CSOs along Brush Creek. Um, this is, this is one, what a CSO, a small one, looks like. If you go out on the, the CSOs on the Missouri River, they're big flat fowls. You'll see them if you go by on a boat. They're about this big around, and they're made to stay closed until they get a, a big flush of water behind them. They'll open up and, and drop water. When they are under pressure, under flooding, the flaps then push shut and seal so that the water doesn't come into the sewer system. There are similar situations that, like that in uh, Brush Creek. I used to live just a few blocks over on, uh, by St. Luke's, and the CSO that served my neighborhood was number 47, and it was by Burns, Barnes & Noble. So the overflow was underneath Barnes & Noble, underneath the corner there, and then went by pipe to Brushy Creek. And, and by the way, those are still working and existent to this day. Uh, they're managed. Uh, the collection of CSO outfalls in Kansas City, they were built over such a long period of time, it could be considered a museum of CSO styles. There are many ways to design them. We have a, just a few of everything. Okay, so I said that, that growth was going on. Well, it, it was relentless. Uh, it, growth was relentless in Kansas City from, 19, from 1850 right on up through the, the 1950s. Just remarkable. Uh, tell you some of the other things that were going on. I just mentioned water pollution, but I'd like to, or water pollution, but I'd also like to talk just a little bit about drinking water. In the 1900s, we were figuring out that you could add lime to water, and you could create a clean water source. Uh, you could then pump it out through those pipes we were laying down, and it was for the first time cities had clean running water that was safe. Also began chlorination, which was a, a key to disease protection. And by the 20s, you were using lime treatment in the smaller towns, in smaller river towns. And by 1940s, chlorination of drinking water had become much more common throughout the system and into the smaller towns of America. In the 1940s, we were starting to build separated sewers, where we actually didn't have the CSOs, but we built storm sewers, and then we built sanitary sewers, what are called sanitary sewers, and those went directly to treatment plants or directly to the river. Again, uh, 1945, Johnson County built their first treatment plant. Now what you found is this was, to my, to my awareness, one of the first treatment plants within the Kansas City area. And what happened is when you had smaller plants discharging to smaller streams, they started treating. Uh, treatment technology had been worked out in Europe about 50 years earlier, you know, 1910, something like that, a little earlier. And so that started coming in, and when you had a small town like Harrisonville or Johnson County, uh, they would build a, a treatment plant. Now, I mentioned that chlorination works. Here's the death rate for typhoid fever in the U.S., deaths per 100,000. Just look what happens when you start chlorinating. It it's just a, was a remarkable disease controller. So you think the water tastes funny, but there's a reason. So by the 1950s, be reminded, we'd been going 100 years great guns with zero treatment. Uh, 
Domestic waste char discharges to the Missouri River, zero treatment through the 1950s. The river smelled. Uh, the West Bottoms was a huge CAFO. It had morphed out into a, a huge cattle uh, animal feeding operation, slaughtering, rendering, and tannery. So through the, through the blue chrome tanning, chromium tanning, uh, rendering, which smells just remarkable. Uh, there's, <laughs> it's, it's just one of the most special smells. Uh, one of the largest renderers in America is called Darling, and I never understood why. I think it's a family name, not a description. Uh, but West Bottoms, I, I heard a, a, a Walt Bodine thing where he said you could ride the cable car across the West Bottoms and just make it cry. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it was just, you know, the, the odor, people, I had a neighbor, he said his dad came home from work, and you, you could just smell him enter the house. It was, you know, just that remarkable. Now, the river was highly degraded. People did not go to the riverfront. They did not consider it beautiful. It had smelled of blood and fat for 100 years. You know, uh, it's just the city held back from the river. We consider it a great resource now. They considered it the sewer, and it got about that much respect. Uh, there were grease balls floating down the river, and, and commercial fishery had, had totally collapsed. And we weren't the only city doing this. Um, if you, I, I looked up records. There was uh, uh, some records kept uh, looking for water quality standards in Iowa, blah, blah, blah. But whatever, they had a description of the city of Omaha in 1968. In 1968, the city of Omaha discharged 38 tons of oil and grease to the river every day. And fat balls the size of softballs floated down. It'd kind of congeal into softball-sized balls of grease. And if you took a boat out, it would slime the bottom of your boat. And those balls went down as far as St. Joe, and St. Joe had a slaughterhouse. And then we come down to Kansas City, and we had the same. 1964, we had a massive fish kill after a rain event. Essentially, when you've got CSOs, you've got a bunch of uh, stored up sewage in the pipes. So you get a big gu gully wash of rain, it can flush all that out into the river at once, causes a big oxygen demand as that waste breaks down, you get a fish kill due to low dissolved oxygen. You know how much interest that got? Newspaper article about that long, because nobody cared. But you know, it, it was reaching a point where the outrage just had to happen, and uh, 69 was it, the Cuyahoga River burned. Let me show you a picture. You know where that's taken? That's 1972, that's where the Caw enters the Missouri River. Scott Mansker and I've sat in a boat right that place. That's a little different now, wouldn't you say? So you, when you look at the, the grease and the oil, and if you could see a color picture, probably red from blood. They weren't collecting blood then. So just all the slaughter that was going on there, thousands of head of cattle a day, right into the river. And this, was, again, was National Geographic 72. Here's a sign of a, here's a fish kill, Cuyahoga River. Cuyahoga was in Ohio. It was one of the most polluted rivers in our country. So fish kills on it were considered commonplace and then flowing into Lake Erie. That's what it would look like if you stuck your hand in the river. And then finally it caught on fire. This was the one that, this was really a defining event in water pollution. It was the point where we said, hey, what have we become? You know, why are we doing this? And, uh, you know, there's always these defining events. There's the, you know, uh, Rachel, Rachel wrote, you know, Silent Spring, and uh, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, or an event like this. You know, it's one of those tipping point events, and this was it. And uh, everybody said, hey, something's got to give here. And uh, that's when President Nixon created the EPA. So that event was pretty much what spurred, there were others as well, but that was the one that really forced us to change. So what occurred then is the, this, the EPA and Congress was firing on all cylinders then, uh, just like now, right? And uh, Clean Water Act in 72, amended in 84, Safe Drinking Act in 19, Safe Drinking Water Act, 1974, amended 1986. And uh, safe water at the tap, the idea of source water protection, the idea of control of industries. Congress did something else too, which was really pretty thoughtful. They, they decided to invest. They put out a bunch of money in terms of grants and they built infrastructure and they set up standards and regulatory programs. And uh, when they gave out that grant money, they required things like long-term planning, what are called 208 plans. We're still using some of those. They said, hey, we're going to give you all this money, 
and you're going to build centralized plants that are efficient and workable, and you're going to spend those grant dollars responsibly, and we're going to check on you. And that's really how the early EPA worked, is it was building stuff and fixing stuff and then checking out to make sure it worked. Clean Water Act, that's what I do for a living, okay? Uh, minimum treatment requirements for municipalities and industry. So you have uh, basic bottom line treatment. I don't care where you are or what you do. You have basic bottom line treatment requirements for all kinds of discharges. Secondary treatment is required for municipals. Now I told you we didn't have uh, treatment in Kansas City here. We got primary treatment, late 60s, barely, and uh, did not get se full secondary treatment in the large facilities in our town until the late 80s. So really it's remarkably late in the game that we got the treatment levels that were required and considered in the Clean Water Act by the seven, from the 70s. Well, we're nearly 20 years late. One of the things they did was effluent guidelines for primary industries, iron and steel, the chemical industry, the semiconductor industry, uh, buggy whips, you know, everything. Basically the big 25, 30 industries had controls based on production. So if you made 1,000 pounds of steel, you, got, you discharged a little rust. Uh, we also work on water quality-based limits. That's something that I do a, a lot. That's one of my main jobs. And there's an NPDES, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System process, in which anyone who discharges gets five-year permits. And those permits have limits that must be met. And that's what I work on, is I'm in the permits program, and I work on those types of limits for all kinds of facilities. I've been in one of almost everything. I talked about infrastructure. I thought I'd show you some of the big infrastructure of Kansas City area. Here are some of the larger cities in Kansas City. It may not be too easy to see, but as, as you look towards the left there, there's Kansas, Kansas City West Side and, Can and Caw Point. So Caw Point cleans water from the Kansas City, Kansas area, and it sits within about a quarter mile of Kansas City West Side, which treats much of the bottoms area. So what used to be just discharged directly to the uh, Kansas River is now discharged with treatment to the Missouri River. Now, if you look in the kind of the center of, of the map there, you've got Kansas City Blue River, and that's our biggest treatment facility in the region. I showed you these three. These are the big three on the Missouri River. There are other treatment plants scattered throughout Johnson County and, 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 the, and in the small towns around us. KC Blue is a, is a pretty big plant. It treats about 80 million gallons a day, just to give you an idea of size. Here's our water treatment plant, just, just north of the downtown airport. That water treatment plant has been on that site for over 100 years. It's been changed remarkably. It's, it's expanded remarkably and provides water to a radius of 25 miles around the city. So that's a huge amount of area, a huge amount of pipes. Uh, as I say, it's been there for all that time. Here's a close-up of Kansas City KCK number one and KC Missouri West Side. I think we can see the river relief building here. Uh, we would also see, uh, if you look up in the river, you can actually see the discharges from those two facilities. See the little mixing zones on each, on each one. Here's what they look like from, from river level. We actually mapped ammonia concentrations in the river to see how large the toxicity effect was from these facilities and how well they mixed with the river to create dilution. This is that Blue River facility. Again, that's, that's a lot of water going by. 80 million gallons a day is a lot of water. I say that's a lot of water, but a power plant, for instance, takes in a lot more. If you look at Casey Hawthorne, it uses something like 600 million gallons of water a day for cooling. So a remarkable amount of water used. I told you that we mapped pollutants from these facilities. This is using modern USGS equipment. This was about six or seven years ago. And what we did is uh, essentially hung monitors down into the water, and then we're taking in GPS data and tagging each piece of data that we receive, we're tagging it with a place and a time. And then I can take that home, run it into a computer mapping program, superimpose it on a picture map, such as a Google Earth map or something like that. Here you can see where we ran transects to map, to, you know, to look at that mixing zone, how it mapped, and then we're able to actually map it visually so you can see how mixing actually occurs in the river. You can see the hot spot in purple near the discharge and then dilution as it goes further downstream. 
Right now, this talk, I said I prepared it five years ago, and what I'm referring to here still goes on. We're making some big decisions. Stormwater and CSO are what really drives the urban infrastructure question right now. Kansas City, Missouri has 56 square miles of CSO pipe. Now you think, oh, we could just separate the sewers, it would be easy. Do you want to dig up 56 square miles worth of your streets and put in an extra set of pipes and, you know, that's, you can do it in places when you have a reason to, but to take on that project, you'd be essentially re a whole city, which is a multiple billions of dollars, a huge cost. Kansas City, Missouri, I mentioned the, you know, the CSO system, and we're in CSO area right here, 6.4 billion gallons of overflow annually. So that's not a trivial amount of water. That's a lot of, you know, stormwater mixed with sanitary water going into our local streams. Uh, the, the main discharges are set into Brushy Creek, Old Turkey Creek, and the Missouri River. The biggest discharge is in Old Turkey Creek, uh, right off the west side of the West Bottoms. Uh, the city, uh, Kansas City and EPA, made a large settlement. We're talking 2.5 billion over a 25 year period. We're five years into that. And so it requires CSO minimization and improvements in other areas, other forms of stormwater and uh, allows for green infrastructure, which is kind of a new idea, which is the idea rather than the old gray infrastructure, a concrete and treatment of that sort. What we're looking at now is green infrastructure. You can actually use more naturalized approaches, rain gardens, things like that is probably the way to best describe it, and use those approaches to capture polluted stormwater from cities and uh, collect that and, and you recharge groundwater as well as uh, get some treatment of the water. We've seen great improvements. What are our new goals? I wrote that five years ago. Right now, the big push is on nutrients. We're finding that we have huge amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus in our streams. Uh, I gave a talk here at Big, big Muddy a couple years back on that subject, but that's where EPA's really been putting in the push is on, on nutrient control. So that's it. Any questions? Yeah, okay.